Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a special virtual program of the Commonwealth Club. My name is Dr. Michael Boskin. I'm the Tully Friedman Professor of Economics at Stanford University and Wolford Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, and I chaired the President's Council of Economic Advisors for four years. I'm also the president of the Corret Foundation, a barrier-based foundation that has a strong interest in preparing students for the future. Coretta has been a long time and an honor to be a funder of the Commonwealth Club, supporting its role as a public civic forum where ideas can be discussed and debated in an environment of civility and mutual respect. That mission could not be more important to the country's future. With support from Coret, the club launched its first official civics education initiative one year ago this week. At that time, the country's civic fabric was being tested by the global pandemic. And since then, a summer of protest, a disputed election and other issues have further challenged America's civic traditions and its history and raised questions about how to prepare students to lead this great country. You're our future, by the way, into the future. <laughs> a renewed investment in comprehensive civic education is one answer of many, but an important one to this challenge, and Coret is pleased and honored to support these efforts. Today's program is particularly important as it makes clear that knowledge about America's civic institutions and traditions and its history isn't solely the responsibility of social studies, uh, history, and civics high school classes, which unfortunately in many schools have been uh, de-emphasized, but we are all responsible for telling America's special story, its highs, its lows, its achievement, its unfinished business, as it tries to attain its ideal of e pluribus unum. Today's program, I'm pleased to see, uh, as it should, features speakers from a wide range of perspectives. The Cred Foundation is pleased and, as I said, honored to help the club honor its one year anniversary of its civics program including today's program. And now I turn the virtual microphone over to the moderator of today's program, Emma Humphreys, the Chief Education Officer for iCivics, one of America's leading civic education organization, whose founder, my dear friend Sandra Day O'Connor, is a Stanford alumna, I'm proud to report, and was the first female Supreme Court Justice. Emma, over to you. I am pleased to be the moderator for today's Commonwealth Club program, Powerful Civics Education. It's everyone's responsibility. This program is part of Creating Citizens, the Commonwealth Club's civic education effort that is celebrating its one year anniversary this week. iCivics is proud that it was part of the launch of this effort a year ago. We are in a critical moment now for civics and history education after a difficult year that tested American democracy. We also have a new effort to help address this challenge, the Educating for American Democracy Initiative, or EAD, a call to action to invest in strengthening history and civic learning and to ensure that civic learning opportunities are delivered equitably throughout the country. EAD provides a new roadmap, guidance and an inquiry framework that states, local school districts and educators can use to transform the teaching of history and civics to meet the needs of a 21st century diverse K-12 student body. Key to the success of this initiative, and as the title of today's program makes clear, is a belief that civic education is everyone's responsibility. Traditionally, civics and history teachers and schools shoulder this responsibility. Today, we need all schools and organizations outside of schools to promote powerful civic learning. I am so glad to be joined today by three people who can help us discuss this further. Dr. Alan Pratt is the Executive Director of the National Rural Education Association. Janet Tran is the Director of the Center for Civics, Education and Opportunity for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. And Emily Kirkpatrick is the executive director of the National Council of Teachers of English. 
An important housekeeping tip before we get started with Alan, Janet, and Emily. If you have a question for me or for any of the other panelists today, please use the YouTube chat feature. Questions asked there will be submitted to me throughout the program, and I will try to ask as many of them as I can. Now, I could not think of a better group to bring together to discuss powerful civics education. And with that, my first question. Sometimes civics and history education gets pigeonholed, thought of merely as the purview of social studies teachers and maybe Boy Scout and Girl Scout troop leaders. But you're not social studies teachers or troop leaders that I know of. So why are you and your groups deeply engaged in civics and history education? And Janet, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you. Sure, Emma, and uh, thank you to the Commonwealth Club for hosting, and uh, thank you, Emma, for um, joining this conversation as a moderator. History intrinsically links our two organizations, um, Justice O'Connor and President Reagan, uh, are part of each other's um, formative uh, path into our history books, and I'm, I'm grateful to be part of this conversation, and also uh, part of the work that we do together as we try to lift uh, civic engagement across our country. I think the answer for me personally is, um, is I am a patriot, love of country uh, in, in a manner that a patriot meaning love of country, which leads to responsibility to leave it better than how you found it. Um, my gratitude is immense um, because my American dream story is, is relatively absurd. My parents are um, refugees from Vietnam who don't have an elementary degree combined. And both of their daughters are uh, doctors, my sister, the kind that battles COVID, and me, the kind that uh, pontificates communities of practice and citizen leadership. Uh, so I'll leave that for you to decide who adds value. Um, but I don't come to this patriotism with uh, any sort of naivety or the belief that we are all afforded the same opportunities. Instead, I approach this with a great sense of responsibility. I really wanna ensure that the conditions are in place for everyone to have that same pride. As for my organization, um, President Reagan called it an informed patriotism. In his farewell address, he uh, asked the country not to get swept up in national pride without that sense of um, understanding of America's place in the world. He compelled students to teach parents American history around the dinner table, not facts and names, but why it's important. And at the Center for Civics, Education, and Opportunity, we work at the nexus of civics and education policy to bring this vision to life. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, we do. Our organizations do have that beautiful shared history. I'm so uh, thankful to you for, for reminding me of that. Emily, you're, you're the, the executive director of the National Council for Teachers of English. Why, why are you talking on a, on a civics education program? We are uh, so happy to be joining this movement and the work um, of educating for democracy. And it, it, the work actually goes back decades and centuries. If we think about the very definition of what literacy is, it's to make sense of our worlds and to have capacity to have independent thought and to come together to pose challenges, to have inquiry around civic challenges, and collaborate together from an individual perspective, from a collective perspective, in order to improve our worlds. And so the very definition of what literacy is, is intrinsically linked, if not perhaps a precursor to civics education. And that's how we're coming at this. And also, you know, with the, re the realization that in today's society, we are all, including our children, not only consumers of information, but also creators. And so how can we work together in order to, again, pose and approach uh, challenges collaboratively? Thank you. And I should share with our audience that I had a lovely opportunity to speak to uh, an audience at NCTE. And, and I made one of my regular points that that every teacher is a civics teacher. And I was so pleased with how well that that message was received. And and surely your members see that strong connection between citizenship and and literacy. So, uh, Alan, you know, National uh, Rural Education Association. I mean, you're, you're looking at education from a very broad lens, um, really focusing on a specific community. What what role? Does, does civic education play in that larger ecosystem? 
First of all, thanks for the invitation for the Commonwealth Club and the NAMA. Thanks. It's always great to connect again. Um, and it's hard to believe it's been a year since we were in Baton Rouge kind of starting this work. And uh, Indeed. it's amazing. Uh, it's been a crazy year. And uh, so we're coming out of it. It makes us feel better for us. You know, our mission is to kind of be the voice and the, the voice of rural schools and rural communities. So if you put community and school, they're, they're intertwined, they're together, they need each other. Uh, Civic-minded, history-minded individuals, it kind of fits everything that we do as an association. It also fits on our future. And the uh, way I look at this is how we serve and commit to our community and how we train, respect, and help each other in our rural communities. This this is was a no brainer for us to be a part of this. Um, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm kind of a storyteller, as you know, Emma. So I'm going to just a short one. Okay. Just a promise. I was in a state, which I will not name. It was a rural state and um, they were having trouble filling board spots on their local school board. Mm. That hit me pretty hard. And, and, and I realized when this opportunity came to us, I realized, you know, we need to make sure that we are teaching our young folks that it's good to serve. It's good to be a part and it's good to have a voice in the community and to represent all of our community. So that was kind of what led me to the other part of this as well. So thank you. Oh, th thank you for sharing that. You know, we always say all politics is local and there is nothing more local and I think more important than, than those school boards. So, so thank you for your attention to that. So, um, Emily, tell me, um, you know, you've been engaged in EAD. You've been talking to us for a while. Your organization serves as a champion. Why does EAD resonate with you and, and what made you and NCTE think, yeah, you know, we'd like to support this work, be a part of this? Well, the approach and the recognition that civics education happens across disciplines is real and it's also refreshing. And just as, you know, children read in every class, you know, so too civics education can and should take place. So that's part one of the reasoning. The second is really the intersection with our view of literacy in a digital age and what it takes to be um, a complete member of, of society and, and contribute as richly as everyone would like. And so civics education is that pathway to following one's dreams and having the capacity um, to put forth ideas and, and problem solving. It also intertwines with the, the absolute need for media literacy um, in order to spur civic reasoning. And as we look forward, I think that's where NCTE will probably make the most pronounced contribution in this space, furthering civic reasoning, civic discourse, and real analysis of the media and the information before all of us, regardless of our age or whether we're the perennial student or maybe young in our educational career. Goodness, that's such a good point. And it occurs to me that until most or any schools have a media literacy department in the same way they have an English one and, uh, and a social studies one, what a powerful team to bring together. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you brought that up, Emma, because th there's growing momentum um, around the idea that media literacy is implicit upon all of us and, and on every discipline. And so I, I really think we're on the edge of breaking out of the notion that it's this add on, but rather it's a fundamental part of education and instruction and participation in society. And there's actually a national alliance moving towards that uh, where many groups are contributing. So this work is just so timely and it has the opportunity to pull together so many different segments and sectors. Yeah, indeed. And, and I, I would say that uh, media literacy and news media literacy is, is foundational to the guidance provided by the EAD roadmap. Janet, I'm going to kind of tweak the question a little bit for you. You know, it, it's a it's sort of a natural fit, I think, for the Ronald Reagan Institute and Foundation to be part of EAD. So based on your long experience in this larger field of civic education, what gives you hope about EAD or makes you think that this might be different? We might accomplish something here. Well, Emma, um, you know, you know that I've served as a teacher in South Central and downtown Los Angeles for almost a decade. And, you know, I have a great understanding of 
what the data tells us and what it doesn't tell us. Um, at the school that I first taught at, only one out of four students graduated. So what that means is uh, the NAEP data that we see year after year, um, every four years or so, that's rather an autopsy than an assessment because there's not much to be done at the current juncture in which we get it. It's actually um, worse than the picture shows us because many of our students don't make it to the 12th grade to be part of that 25% or so of proficient students. So access to civic learning is really the social justice issue of our time to think about how do we um, ask our government to serve us and be part of that social contract. And so many of our students are bereft of that knowledge, that information and that empowerment. So I know, I know how social studies, civics and history has been marginalized. I have a deep understanding of the factors. Um, as a department chair, I also saw the consequences when teachers themselves were not um, you know, equipped and supported in teaching civics. So what I really um, am attracted to uh, when I sort of came on board this initiative and um, looked to uh, the team in EAD is obviously a group of committed organizations. Um, one, it's inquiry-based. So we're asking questions with design challenges. Uh, that leaves room for states and local organizations uh, to, to be critical to offer dissent. And I think what's very, very important about a coalition um, and I think I'll quote President Reagan here is the person who agrees with you 80% of the time is a friend and an ally, not a 20% traitor. So when you look at this framework and this guidance, it's not a mandate by any stretch of the imagination. It provides a lot of um, great guidance and um, questions in which you can work and ensure that this is working for your students. And as a teacher, they know best how to do so. So I love the fact that there is that support but there isn't additional pressure um, to make a teacher's job harder because after this year, I think we can all agree we don't want to make a teacher's job any more difficult. We sure don't. And I have to say, in addition to sharing that magnificent quote, which I'm going to remember and, and certainly borrow because that, that is brilliant. Um, you sort of reminded me of another important part of this, which is which is context and, and community and, and providing guidance to local to states and local school districts to make these decisions um, for themselves. Uh, so. Alan, that makes me think about your role in, in rural communities. It seems to me that in most educational movements in the United States, the, the population of interest are young people in urban areas. And, and I'll be the first to admit that when I think about a promising new education program or intervention, I often wonder how it might work out in Chicago or Atlanta or Oakland. Talk to us about why a revival of civics and history is just as important for young people in rural areas. So, so we, we look at this as kind of an ROI, return on investment of, of into our students in our community. And what we see across the nation, when you have successful communities that have engagement and they're, 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 they're really looking at the place and context of what, what it means to be from their community and what it also means to be from a state and from the national sense as well. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to glance for a second, but I got three points I'm going to make with this. And here, here's the key. Uh, what we see from really successful rural communities is they always have a sense of context and place awareness. And, and kind of what we mean by that is how, why is our town important? What's the history of our town, the good, the bad, and the ugly? But, but what can we learn moving forward about our town and make our town sustainable and make our school sustainable moving forward? The other aspect is they engage their students. And they engage their students to be leaders. They engage their students to be active in the civic process. They engage them to be part of the school board, to part of the city and county commission. They engage them to solve problems in their community and to be the innovators of the future. And then the, the third and fourth, they explore their local regional history, which we talked about. And we all know that it, it, in any successful community, this could be urban, suburban, and, uh, and rural, they all understand that all the items that I listed above are vital to success. So the history and the civic understanding and engagement of what, what, what we're all about and what we do, and how do I go about making change in my community? That's, that's, why, that's why we're a part of this. That's why it's important. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, I'm a, I, I taught science. I was a biology teacher, but I was also a closet history teacher. And what I mean by closet history teacher is I would always try to interject that history lesson into all the science that I taught at, at the high school level. Uh, I do that with my children now. They get tired of it, but I always give them the did you know facts of things we learned from the past. So long answer, but uh, it's exciting for me. 
Uh, no, it's brilliant. And as a, a, an ambassador of the civic education field, we definitely consider you, you one of us. I love that second point um, about giving students a voice. And it, I think it serves as a great segue to what I want to talk to Emily about um, and in terms of the ways in which literacy, uh, ELA instruction, and civics really can go hand in hand. So, so, Emily, talk to us about where do you see the existing strengths of the ELA discipline in promoting this vision of EAD? And where do you see perhaps potential growth in the coming years? Where, where can we do a better job of working together as history and civics educators? And, and English educators. Having forums like this is uh, represents an amazing step forward. And thank you again uh, to the Commonwealth Club and everyone behind organizing this uh, particular session. So there are many things that are going on that I think are going to lead us forward. Uh, the recent session, Emma, that you participated in during NCTE's annual Leadership and Advocacy Summit revealed just how much English language arts educators do on a daily and a weekly basis that feeds into civics education. And perhaps we just don't identify it as such. We identify it as student voice as developing rhetorical skills and analysis skills, um, parsing plot lines and, and information, that type of a thing, but it really adds up to civics education. So I think a big thing that needs to happen is a step back and pulling together um, truly what's happening and um, having confidence that we're already doing so much um, and then inserting into this incredible movement that's um, on the way. I think there's so much that we could also do in terms of lifting up opportunities where students are publishing works, whether that's fiction or nonfiction, um, elevating the student voice. We're also supportive of journalism classrooms across the country. Uh, teaching and studying journalism works hand in hand with English. And in fact, journalism teachers are a, a significant portion of our membership base. I think you're going to um, see in the coming year that NCTE elevates that more and synchronizes um, a lot of platforms where there is student voice and student writing that is civic facing. So that's just a taste of, of what's to come. Just a taste indeed. And I, I agree with there's there's so many opportunities here. I have to say, sort of as a as a personal organizational note, our, our newest hire at iCivic, she'll be starting in a in a few weeks, um, is a former high school journalist, uh, editor of her high school newspaper, you know, cut her teeth in the in the high school newsroom. And and I'm just so delighted of the op the opportunities for her background to intersect with with our current work in civics. That's that's fantastic and a live illustration of um, what what we're sensing and uncovering and the the roadmap produced by educating for democracy, I think, is an invitation for every organization and every educator to really become an intimate part of this work and internalize the places where we can contribute most to this roadmap that will strengthen our society. Yeah. Here, here. So I'm going to bring us sort of into the, the current context right now um, and, 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 and pose a couple of problems really for anyone. Feel free. I, th I think I'm going to start with Janet because I just I just want to pick on her on this one because uh, she's, she's coming from that civic ed background. Um, but Dr. Boston in his introduction and of course in mine, we both talked about um, some of the, the, the crises we've had around our democracy. It's, it's been a rough year, uh, calendar year for multiple reasons. So, you know, I don't have to tell you or anyone listening that the nation is deeply divided. Uh, but there is broad support for civics and history education. In a recent poll by pollster Frank Luntz, civic education polled higher than any other issue as having the greatest potential positive benefit on strengthening our national common identity. And here's what I mean. Responding to the question, what would have the most positive and meaningful impact on strengthening American identity? 56% of Democrats and Republicans agreed on the choice of civics education. This choice outpolled less money in politics, stricter regulation of social media, easier access of voting, and more participation in religious activities for both self-identified Democrats 
and Republicans. So at a time when Americans can't seem to agree on anything and we run to our, our polls, to our end zones on every issue, there's this widespread agreement that civic education is a solution to what ails our democracy. So, so my question uh, for Janet and others, feel free to, to respond directly to Janet or to me. How can we better leverage this rare cross-partisan agreement? So Frank puts together um, the best focus group. So I, I love any sort of data sets that he puts out. And um, obviously, I, I want to focus, um, I'll start with the glass half empty argument. Um, there, there's a lot to be concerned about, um, you know, from 2016's uh, Fall and Monk research saying globally, we have a trend that has... Um, has our young people saying it's not very important for them to live in a democracy, um, saying that they uh, feel that they should let a strong man decide uh, where we're going. Some feel that socialism is absolutely a great option for uh, a place to, a country to operate within. So we have a lot of concerns globally and we don't, um, we are not just you know, stuck within our, our own boundaries. Um, I would say too about this, uh, this 56%, I'd say there's a passive support for civics. Um, and I want everyone listening to really think about, you know, you, you don't run to the polls about civics. You don't, um, parents aren't calling schools saying, I need a STEM club. You know, they, that's what they're calling for. They don't say, I need a civics club. So really thinking about what that support looks like, if we can uh, translate that to um, being the zealous uh, type of support, um, you know, if we could be radically pragmatic in our demands for civics, I think we would actually uh, be able to get us to that next level that so many of us are, are interested in. So thinking about what our support is, it, are we raw rawing for our home team or are we just like, that's not a, that's not a bad idea, but I'm just gonna watch from the television. So really hoping that all of us out there step, step that up, um, your support into some sort of active support. Now, I think the glass half full argument for me is, um, you know, all of us as individuals think back on um, an event you've done, a um, you know some sort of achievement, and you're looking through all the feedback, and it's all great. And then there's that one comment, right? That is just it just burns at you, and you think about it for weeks, months on end. So there is a real human element that um, for us to focus on what's not working and the narratives in the media of how um, polarized and how separate and how. Um, just how not together we are as one country. Uh, we actually agree on a great many things. And I know Alan knows this, especially at the local level. Uh, social scientists and, and psychologists are actually suggesting that, uh, well, we have an emphasis on what they're calling false polarization. So these tropes of um, the, the constant attention to how different we are. And we tend to, uh, the findings say we tend to exaggerate those differences. So, uh, you know, they, they would say, you believe that the other person thinks you're worse than they actually think. Um, I am, again, I'm not uh, sugarcoating this. We have a, a very severe problem to uh, address as a country. We certainly have seen um, the outcomes on January 6th. There's nothing uh, to be, um, you know, to play out as normal. These are very alarming circumstances. But we do have a lot of consensus. Uh, we, we have a fair consensus on how, how to handle the pandemic. Uh, we have a lot of consensus on crim criminal justice, um, early childhood issues, um, how do we handle substance abuse and how important that is. So we as a country, I feel like in some ways, um, you know, we need some massive couples counseling where it's like, no, you really don't feel that way about each other. That's just how you feel. It's a little back and forth, right? We're building on it. And again, I'm not suggesting that this misinformation or this deep national reckoning is not um, a severe and serious problem and we should tend to it immediately, not uh, wait for the next generation. But we should also work towards um, the American promise. When you say, you know, protecting this agreement, I think focusing on, um, you know, disagreeing with, with, uh, within the parameters of not making ourselves enemies, we're tribal creatures, we want to belong to teams, right? So I think our struggle right now is telling a story where we are all on the same team, an American story where we are all part of it. 
Wow, thank you for that. That that really speaks to me. Um, it's some I've I've always not always, but in my adulthood, I've lived in places that are sort of ideologically different from my own personal beliefs, and, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I really love talking to people who identify uh, politically in a different manner and and looking for points of agreement. And I'll I'll say something I'd love to share with with all of you and and our and our viewers today is uh, the Better Arguments product uh, project rather the Better Arguments project um, making. The the case that it's okay to argue and to have arguments. We just need to do it better. Uh, I think that sort of feeds into that nationwide couples counseling we need. Um, and what stands out to me right out of the gate is just taking winning off the table and having conversations where your, your ultimate goal is, is to seek to understand. Um, and I'd love for, uh, for Emily or Alan to chime in. Alan, you probably feel like uh, you're, you're engaging in some couples counseling with members of the community. And, and what do you, <laughs> maybe not, um, and what do you find is helpful to, to bridge the divide and help people see that they probably have a lot more in common than they might realize? You know, for, for us, couples counseling may be a little bit uh, extreme. It may be like a, um, a watching a video that you're going to have to t do the check boxes on before you get finished. But, um, you, you know, I, I think for us, it's it's especially looking at this conversation of there, there are things we agree on. And, and what I do when I go across the country and, and, and we'll pick that travel up hopefully pretty soon. Um, I don't, I don't talk about the big D at the end of someone's name or the big R at the end of someone's name. I talk about it being an American and talking about being uh, inclusive of all, but, and I think for the most part, people are, are pretty good with it. Um, there are extreme issues in certain areas of our country. We understand that, but I know it's coming up on a later question, but I'm just going to hit this quickly real quick. I, I see positives and I see positives from a lot of areas and I see positives, how we can rebound and be a better country. And, and that, that's what keeps me going. That's what to answer the, the glass half empty, half full. I'm, I'm looking at filling a pitcher. So it's not a glass. So we're kind of looking at the whole thing and, and, and I feel good about the process. I feel good about, what we're going to do in the future. That being said, we do have serious conversations and we need to be, I like your, the better argument, how to argue, how to argue better, raising a teenage daughter. I've, I'm in that category and I do a good job with that, that work, but I agree. I love to talk to people that believe totally differently than I do because you learn, you become a better person because you understand their frame and their framework. So uh, for me, I'm seeing a lot of positives out there, and I'm also um, know we have challenges. So, thanks, <laughs> Emily. Please. This reminds me of a conversation that I recently shared with Justice Sonia Sotomayor, whom I believe is also a board member of of iCivics uh, as part of that legacy. Um, and and she shared, and I believe it's also true that. When she studies an issue coming before the court, the more she studies it, the more nuances become evident. And, and she shared that with our uh, membership base just a few year, a few months ago. That, that is so true. And NCT is taking very seriously the manipulation of media, um, including beyond this country and yet imposed upon us. And the, the importance um, to be analyzers all the time so that we can all be free and all make educated choices and hopefully move past some of the polarities that threaten our very value system. And so that's why we're getting ready to announce a screening of a documentary that's not yet been released exactly on that topic of, you know, how much do you trust information and are you sure that you're getting information from a variety of sources in order to form opinions and, and make analysis? So, um, the polarization is very real. I think when we, whether we're students, educators, or playing both roles, take a step back and really analyze things, um, the world is far more nuanced than many would lead us to believe. And I'm always encouraged when I visit classrooms and students see difference at an early age. I think that's scientifically proven. And yet, 
students get along and they find ways to relate to one another and have common goals and common experiences. And um, we have a lot to learn and emulate uh, from that. Yeah, we sure do. I, I suppose when your goal is just to have fun or to find a playmate, uh, difference is, it means nothing. Let's just play. So you brought up media literacy again, and I just want to mention, I know I know our panelists are, are probably not seeing the chat. It's, it's too distracting to watch that and, and also to engage. But there's there's been a little bit of uh, a bit of love for media literacy, a, a lot of uh, heads bobbing. Um, love to know where we can make stronger intersections between media literacy and civics, where we see sort of the most uh, promise for, for that intersection. Um, is this a, a, a case that you're seeing um, policy around Jan? It, is this a case you're having to make um, in rural communities, Alan? And, and of course, uh, Emily, I know because you've been sharing with us that, that, that English teachers more and more in your organization specifically are, are taking this on a, as a priority. Well, I just want to jump in and say, absolutely, it is at the forefront of a, a lot of uh, thinkers and, and thought leaders in the education policy space. And I will pause it to say that let's not pretend this is only for young people. I think we're running into a problem now that us adults are clicking on links that are not so um, substantive <laughs> and, and trustworthy. So I, I really imagine that this is um, a, a very large scale, um, you know, starting early with teacher training and really thinking about that next generation. And of course, um, as with any social problem, it's going to involve not just uh, journalists, but also uh, consumers, and uh, watchdogs and uh, private sector and responsibility as well. And to not conflate um, unpopular opinions with just downright unreal scenarios, uh, making sure that we are holding, uh, holding our businesses and our private sector sort of champions responsible, but also stepping back to say, there's a real difference when I disagree with your opinion, as opposed to when you have a broken public faith and trust and have just spread misinformation entirely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Alan, talk to us about, about this issue in, in your communities and what you're hearing. I mean, I, I think uh, Janet made a good point about trust, about trust of, of where the information is coming from. Um, I recently did a uh, panel with a group in Ohio, and we were talking about the, the media access and, and uh, uh, broadband access for our young students mm -hmm. in, in rural communities. And they identified by their ability to connect and to, to get information. They also... We know this moving forward. They're not looking through the three major channels to find news or a news right. network. They're looking on their device to get the news. So I think training of community members, Janet made a great point. Adults need to learn. And, uh, <laughs> and, and also our students on what is, a, what is a legit source and what is not a legit source. What can I trust and what can I not trust? And to raise the awareness. This is almost like teaching someone to drive a car. It's almost like teaching someone to surf and, and all that good stuff. But it, this is how do we know if it's legit or not legit? And I think that's a key uh, indicator. I, I will say that that is going on more than you might imagine in a lot of schools, especially the high school level. I do think middle school and some elementary school, that needs to be that needs to happen as well. So, Emily, I'm with you on uh, that moving forward. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Alan. And um the addition that I would make to this is also um, owning and, and taking leadership in the recognition that students of all ages, as well as adults, are also now ubiquitous creators of content. So, yes, civics education needs to lean into responsible consumption and analysis of information and media. Absolutely. The and is also creating new opportunities for students to experiment with creating content and creating content that's responsible and inclusive and informed. And that's a really exciting area where we also celebrate a lot of um, engagement from students. It's something that really excites students and we think there's so much more to be done there. And in fact, we have a new policy brief um, that's out discussing just that. That's magnificent. So, so many of these things we've talked about, um, especially with, with 
Emily, your points about the, the skills we need. And I, I'm seeing them coming from the English department, but also complementing the social studies department. And it it's the best example of a twofer I've seen in a really long time. And, you know, when we're so worried about instructional time and when, you know, for, for us, a major case in civic education to make the case for more instructional time, the first question is always going to be, well, where would you like us to take it from? And I think we could make the point here that you don't have to take it from anywhere. If we all sort of collaborate more, um, you're, you're teaching kids these important literacy skills and media literacy skills while also teaching them civics. And you can do this in a science class and you can do this in mathematics. Don't ask me for examples. That, that's really tough for me. But I bet a mathematician or math teacher could, could do that. No problem. You, you better believe it, you know, even using statistics to then inform a piece of writing. I mean, there's there's so much crossover. And in reality, that's how our world operates now. So why not approach this um, differently than from silo to silo? Alan used to be a science teacher. Help me out. What, what are some good examples? Uh, gonna, yeah, no sample lesson today. Uh, but but I will tell you, you know, I think the positive of COVID has given us the ability to be flexible in education. And we've shown that we can be really flexible really quickly. And I, I think we don't I think we have the opportunity to, to collaborate more like you talked about. And this is the perfect timing. And we don't I mean, I hate what happened to our country, but I'm looking at positives coming out of COVID is we don't have to be a five day a week brick and mortar. We can be flexible. We can do a lot of different things. We can do community engagement. And I just think the, the opportunities are there to really drive this work. So that's that's uh, that's the positive moving forward for me. God, that's such a great point. There, there's so many silver linings and we, we've all fallen victim to saying that phrase, you know, return to normal when we return to normal. And I think, I think most of us come around to say, well, let's, how about a new normal, a better normal? Um, and, and certainly for, for education and a more interdisciplinary approach, um, I think would be wise. Now to do that, of course, we're going to need, we're going to need some national mindset shifts. And I think that's something we all think about. And I think we're going to need some, some policies. So, so Janet, I want to turn to you and, and talk about sort of how do we do this at a policy level? Um, I know that in your work, you're, you're looking at this at a very from a very state based approach to, to history and civics, um, especially when it comes to informing leaders about educating for American democracy. So talk to us about this strategy, the state based strategy and, and, and how this message for more and better civics and history education is being received. Well, I think, um, you know, two reasons why I think we've um, been really uh, committed to lifting and elevating the, the voice of the state. First of all, this past year has shown us how important the governors, the school superintendents, the commissioners are. Um, you know, and Alan has um, alluded to this, which is, you know, the, the premise of our civics experience tied to place. And in fact, that's actually um the second theme of the EAD framework is that, you know, our lived history and lived civics experience should be um, relevant to our lives. And we all know that students are existential hedonists and they're not paying attention to anything we say unless it somehow relates to them as well. So there's multi-factors as to why we should be uh, honoring their life experiences that is very tied to local and state uh, spaces. So the students that I taught in South Central Los Angeles should not be learning the exact same thing uh, that students in Oklahoma are learning. And um, there are civic values that will cross those geographic lines. Our care and, and our connection will be rooted in places that we ultimately identify and call home. Um, so that's the first reason. We, we know it has to connect. There has to be pedagogy. Um, and they have to see themselves in the curriculum. It doesn't mean every single second of the day, but there has to be some sort of relationship um, to, to history and their place in the American story. Um, we don't want an American story that is, um, you know, that is entirely exclusive of their experiences. It doesn't mean the American story revolves around them either, but we ultimately want something that is reasonably tied uh, to our changing landscapes, as, as EAD calls it. The second reason is, um, you know, I now work in Washington, D.C., and I know there's a ton of smart people out here, but innovation's just not going to come from the federal level. Okay. It's just not. And if you're holding your breath and waiting for that, um, that's just never the way it's worked. Our states have always led the way. They've always shown us exemplars, and we've scaled up to the certain extents in which we can when it comes to educational progress. So I'm a student of history, and what, from what I found is 
mandates and education, they just don't sit well with the American people. No one wants to be told what to do. And I don't want to get into that whole, you know, deep well, but I do understand, um, you know, in 1983, uh, the nation at risk was uh, released and it was a report direct to the American people. And I think when uh, spoken to, the American people respond. If uh, given mandates to the states that they have to follow this rule or get that, you know, we're, we're looking at a very different um, response from individuals. So the focus on the states is both real and also effective because we know this is not like civics is not happening around the country. We just simply aren't um, showcasing the great work that's happening across the states. And we're not using the same language. So I've had people ask, what is the, you know, what's the same um, right of center type organization as, you know, perhaps a more left of center or civic action type, um, you know, program? And my response would be they wouldn't call it civics. They might call it the Rotary Club. They might call it, you know, the, the 4-H Club. You know, they're not uh, cognizant of calling it civics. And there's a point. Words matter, certainly, uh, using the correct lexicon. But sometimes they don't matter. And we should also honor when we are doing the right work but we're just simply using language that we might not recognize. That's a really great point. And yeah, you're right. Americans don't like to be told what to do. Um, we really don't like to be told what to do in terms of how we should educate. Um, and then that goes up to another level uh, of not allowed nuclear, don't touch it when you're talking about what to teach in terms of history and civics. Um, and so I'll be the first to admit that when, when EAD was first starting up, I thought, whoa, 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 are we, I, you know, I, I, oh, excuse me, I'm also a student of history. Uh, so I know about the, the history wars of the early nineties and I'm thinking, oh my, I really hope this isn't a redux. Um, and, and it's not, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that this, this takes a different approach. It, it provides guidance. So for people listening today, how can we, how can we take this guidance, look to this roadmap its principles, its guidance around sort of the, the big enduring questions to teach the design challenges. What would that look like in terms of implementation? How can that look like at a state level? What, what sort of policy does that require? How does it look like uh, in, in communities? And in, what does it look like, I should say, in communities and, and in classrooms? Um, really like to have a, a conversation here about, about EAD in real life. There's this guidance. We need this. We need this integrated approach. We need inquiry. We need depth. We need to grapple with our hard histories. We need to cultivate reflective patriotism. What does that mean in terms of, of policy and the work in, in states and schools and classrooms? And I, I, I welcome anyone to, to join in. I'll, I'll take the first crack at that. I think uh, a really important part of this is recognizing that educators and teachers specifically are professionals. And building on Janet's comments and, and Alan's as well as yours, Emma, we don't need a prescriptive approach, but a roadmap that then gives the freedom to bring in expertise and um, make choices about what materials, or in the case of the English language arts teacher, which text relate most to what the teacher's trying to teach and um, offers opportunities for the students before them to have information that relates to their sense of place and their sense of community while also expanding their opportunity to, to see the world and to see things that are different from what that locale presents. So I would start from a, a really strong position of recognizing teacher expertise and offering sustained opportunities, which I think the Growing Coalition um, is already doing and will be growing, for teachers to come in and out and learn, potentially from sessions such as this with the Commonwealth Club, and then apply it to um, follow their professional pathway in terms of what they're teaching and, and selecting uh, to make the teaching come to life on a, a daily and weekly basis. 
Yeah, thank you. I can see, you know, I can see the sort of the, the top down approach, you know, one ideal, of course, would be for states to revisit their their civics and history standards and to do so with the roadmap as a guide. Um, but you could have states that just redid their standards and said, we're not touching those for another decade, uh, come up with another strategy. And, and that strategy can be working with local school districts, create civic learning plans, just going into schools and, and piloting programs in schools, um, working with teachers. I, you know, your, your point about treating teachers as professionals and focusing on them, I, I, I can't agree more. And I, to your point about standards, I think that's really where there also should be a recognition of expertise. And if we're talking specifically social studies history, there is a specific disciplinary expertise um, that should be informing such standards, hopefully with, with many of us at the table cheering on and, and giving great ideas. Uh, but it's both let, let's teach across the disciplines and have a much more integrated approach as well as also recognize that each discipline does have um, in-depth specialized expertise. Yeah, here, here. So, so Alan, rural communities have, have a lot of concerns from, from tariffs and healthcare to broadband and infrastructure. When you talk to rural leaders, how do you make the connection between education and, and civics education in particular um, and these other issues that feel more pressing? You know, how do you make the case for civics and or do you even have to make the case? Is there is there already sort of a, a, a broad appreciation for it or or is it more passive like uh, like Janet talked about earlier? Yeah, I think it's passive in a sense. But I think if you look at our state affiliate history, most of our state affiliate history, they were formed around a crisis or something that was going on at that moment. And they were formed around a civic and history process in the sense of, hey, we have to form a group to make a change. We have to join a group to make a change. And I think when you listed the four connection points there, they're all connected back to what, what can I do as a citizen? What can I do as a community member to make it better? And uh, I think that's from the legislative side or from the uh, civic organization. That's what that's that's the point I make. And, and, and if we're talking about, say, broadband and the infrastructure issues that we, we know we're dealing with, it, and I think Janet almost gave an amen when you said uh, big government sometimes or D.C. doesn't can't solve all of our problems. And I think for this broadband issue, that's a big issue. And I think being civic minded and being part of a group and working together collaboratively in a region can make that process move rather rapidly. So I, I think that's what I see. And um, and I live in a small community. I live in a town of thirty five hundred people and very, very uh, engaged community. And if something goes on that they're not happy with, they form and they get together and they change it. And I think that's the beauty of what we're about. The first school I taught at in Los Angeles had 5,000 people. So <laughs> that goes to show that we should not be teaching the exact same thing to all yeah, of our students. Across I the would country. agree, yes. <laughs> Janet, how do you make the case in, in D.C. to, to lawmakers and, and uh, fellow policymakers that, that civics is, you know, there's all these other crises to deal with, all these le other legislative priorities. How do you get civics the airtime that it deserves? Well, we do have that benefit of the passive support, as I mentioned before. Um, I think the piece that is harder to compel people to bring it to front is one, there, there's a fear of the messiness that gets involved, um, becoming uh, and incredibly politicized, obviously, and polarized. Um, there's also this uh, real, um, I find, foundations and um, you know, lawmakers alike are very much overwhelmed by the longitudinal long haul effort that this takes. Um, this, is, this might be shocking to folks in the space, uh, part of our civics familia who are sort of the lifers. They are on board, they are the choir and it's very difficult for them to maybe um, understand that for others, they want to solve this within two, three years max within a, a political cycle. And that's not going to happen. So, you know, I'll give a little example of uh, how this looks in the classroom, because democracy is messy. And we need to bring people on board to understand that messy and discomfort is actually part of the process and that our students need to be comfortable with it. That this isn't just oh my goodness, I've been offended or I've been made uncomfortable, that's the end of the conversation. That is a painful, growing part of the conversation, and certainly they shouldn't be subject to constant abuse. That is not what I'm suggesting. 
But our young people have a greater capacity than I think we give them credit for. Uh, we run a program at the Reagan Institute called Leadership in the American Presidency, where we bring collegiate students from east, west, middle of the country, first to leave their small town in Indiana to you know, a UC Berkeley student rooming with a, a student from a small Benedictine college in Texas. And they learn leadership through the lens of the American presidency, but they learn just as much from each other. Um, we're investing in this next generation of citizen leaders and we're inoculating them to the concept of collaboration, to um, kind of rejecting this otherness. And we hope that they're cultivating these relationships at an early age. So when they are in their places of respective leadership, um, they can have the ability to work uh, across difference. Um, we tell them, you know, to look at each other um, and we, we're not looking to change their minds about issues, but we hope that they change their minds about one another. Uh, we find and, you know, the literature also supports that once you've actually changed your conception of why you come to a policy issue, uh, that you're much more able to um, make progress and where we overlap in the Venn diagram, we have to move forward as opposed to saying, well, I disagree with you here, so I guess we're at a standstill and let's continue with the status quo, right? So I think um, it's a messy process and we need to embrace the fact that democracy is messy and a lot of our best learning happens um, amidst that mess. And we're more resilient than we think. This isn't just, oh my gosh, we ran into this and now it's, um, you know, we'll never speak to each other again. That is actually not the way young people look at it. And young people are certainly, if you have the opportunity to work with young people like I do, I think you have a much more optimistic sense of where our country is going to be. Emily, did you want to say something? Janet's piece there just reminded me, yes, democracies are messy and democracies make mistakes. And what attribute is more fundamental to being human? I think a core part of this moving forward is recognizing and embracing humanity and um, that's just another example of what English language arts will be bringing to the table and, and recognizing in a different way, I suppose, is a better way to say it. You know, literature teaches humanity and much of what Janet is saying um, crosses over into um, our discipline and, and probably many others if, if we care to take a look. I love that. And I, lo I love the focus on young people. I don't get to work with young people enough, but I'll tell you, I take advantage of every opportunity, every invitation. Uh, two evenings ago, it, it was dinner time here. I should have been going to pick up the kids, had to send the husband out. Uh, but I was talking to eighth grade history students in, in L.A. County. It was so much fun. I, the, the young people give me hope. And whenever anyone says kids these days, I just cut them off and I say, they're amazing and they're going to save us all. But we need to invest in them. We need to invest in their education. And we need to think of civic education as, as a right. As and, and I'm not saying that we need a constitutional amendment to say that it's so, but um, we need to think of it that way. We need that national mindset shift that, that truly values civic education and prioritizes it and invests in it. Um, I can't believe this has happened so quickly. We've now reached the point in our program where there is time for only one last question. Um, so this question is something I'm gonna pose uh, for everyone, which is what is one thing people can do in their communities to make civic education a priority for all? You know, as, as Janet said, it, it, this is the long game. We're not gonna make everything better overnight. And, and I want solutions quickly too, but I know that you know, all those wonderful potential solutions out there, none of them are gonna work without, without more and better civic education. So, so what can folks do to make civic education a priority within their communities or within their spheres of influence? Well, the first thing that comes to mind, I'll jump in, um, and it's probably not the best answer because it's just the first thing that comes to mind, but we have a lot of research that says um, being invited to the table, being asked uh, matters a lot. And actually, interestingly enough, uh, Professor Joe Kahn out at Riverside, uh, a great civics hero, uh, you know, said that something that actually um, motivated principals to highlight or emphasize civics more in the school was a simple question of whether their boss, the superintendent asks, what are you doing about civic learning? So similarly, if that principal asks the teacher, what are you doing about civics? Or how are you being engaged? And of course we have to translate this for our students. I think in our community, asking each other that question, inviting people to participate. Um, so many people feel 
left out of the process and they don't show up, but often it's because we haven't asked. So really inviting people to join, join the club, if you will. Yeah. I, and for me, I would just, uh, just kind of echo Janet's statements on the, the point of the, uh, the invitation to be a part of the community, but in part of the school and engage the school in that conversation. Um, you know, when I was a principal and, and a teacher, we had a lot of students that really didn't belong in a lot. And they just didn't feel like they were a part of certain things. We have community members in the same situation. People want to belong to something that people want to be tied to something that they can be proud of, but also, you know, work within. And I think the invitation and to give people hope and there's people that care about them and, and across the board, I think that's the way to do this. And I think it's also asking the question about civics, but it's also it's a it's a exercise in showing what it means to be a civic minded person and to be a community member that's actively involved. That's the be best way to win them over. And that's the best way to get them involved in what you're doing. So thanks. Emily. I'll try to be quick. Um, I think building on the prior comments, really seeking to understand rather than to assume, and then having thoughtful dialogue and, and modeling that to everyone around us. So embracing reasoning and just a real spirit of inquiry. Why does democracy work this way or perhaps not? Or why does my neighbor think this and I think something very different? And just having the sense of, I, I want to understand and I want to further my knowledge rather than um, just add more cement around where my feet are at this particular time. I have to say, knowing that all of you, your respective organizations, the over 130 champions of educating for American democracy, knowing that uh, we're all in on this gives me so much hope. Um, and and Alan, yeah, I'm with you. L looking for the positives here, and I, I see them on the screen before me. So unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's program. I want to thank all of our speakers today and, of course, the Commonwealth Club, our host for today's program. The club will soon be posting this video along with other civic education resources on its website at www.commonwealthclub.org. I am Emma Humphreys of iCivics and this special virtual education program of the Commonwealth Club is concluded. <laughs>